Hey folks, I'm gonna give it a few moments here for others to get joined. Tim St. Clair, thanks for joining. You're first up on the agenda once we get going. And there's Mikkel. We're gonna give things a few moments for others to get joined, but thank you, Mikkel, and we've got you on the agenda and thank you for coming today. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get things rolling here. Welcome, everybody. Today is the Tuesday, April 30th, 2019 Working Group LTS meeting. We are recording this meeting and we'll be posting it to YouTube afterwards. So please remember the community of conduct and behave appropriately because the world is going to see everything you do. Um, I just pasted the agenda minutes document into the Zoom chat for those who don't have it. If folks could do as Jordan's typing in there right now, put your name on the attendance, I would appreciate it. We have a couple of things on the agenda that could take a bit of time. So I wanna make sure we time box them and but make sure we get to each thing. So the, the couple of bigger things on the agenda initially are Tim St. Clair to talk about his proposal document. And then we've talked about having some sort of experience reports from users of the project. And we have Michael Larson here today from Zalando to talk about their experiences. And then there's a couple other things, time permitting, that we could touch on hopefully quickly as well. So Tim just pasted in his document link, it looks like. Yes, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Tim. Maybe, do you think 15, 20 tops for this? Sure. Okay. Great. Let me um, share my screen and can just walk through it. So we talked, I don't know, was it a month ago, uh, where I kind of outlined some of the initial frameworks of this. And basically what all I did was add verbiage and a sort of a sequence diagram around sort of the proposed model that I discussed like a month ago. Um, <clears throat> the one thing about this document to take into my, or take into account when reading it, is that there's a bunch of open-ended questions that will result, that will come up as you read them. And there was an explicit punt in this document to not to define a set of policies, right? There's a, a bunch of ways you could define policy around implementation details with regards to a specific way of doing something. So this is more of a model, right? This is a proposal on the baseline of a model, and then there's a bunch of forks in the road that will occur in this model, and those are policy decisions that could be their own caps, right? It's a question of whether or not this model makes sense for the community. And also, one of the things, I don't know if I actually wrote that in this doc, I know we talked about it, is that there are, some, there are some preconditions that we wanted to apply to this model. Like, I don't think this model makes any sense at all until APIs have gone to V1, right? Uh, I think, and I should probably add that to as a precondition. And maybe to throw that out there just more explicitly for anybody who's newer on the call, as a work group, we're trying to explore the problem space, open-ended, open-minded, but there's base stability things that need to happen in addition to any potential model changes, whatever they may be, mechanisms and policy all aside in the concrete. Yeah, so the question is whether or not this is good for the community and if it makes sense. So I'll talk through sort of the, the model uh, that uh, we discussed last time and now it's got more verbiage and diagrams to support it. So. The basic idea is that you release an actual stable release every 12 months, but you continuously publish a develop release on a monthly cadence by hook or by crook. 
Uh, and the purpose of getting that developer release out there is to get you early signal back on features and uh, changes that you are making uh, across that lease process. One of the things that we talked about before is that we don't actually have uh, alpha and beta releases currently being published. Uh, and a lot of times our dot zero release is never a stable release. Those are common threads that have occurred throughout the history of Kubernetes. So the purpose of this is to get that early signal out and to promote uh, people along the way to try and use those features. Um, you can do promotion uh, via several means. One way is to like give them speaking slots at, at uh, KubeCon or CNCF uh, based events to talk about or to publicize these new features and the changes that are coming. Um, and uh, as you publish over time, getting this uh, 11 month cadence of getting these releases out, you should have better signal and better ideas of what, what's working and what's not working before you actually flip the switch to stable. Uh, the, after the 11th release, uh, there's basically no changes and you lock down master and you force the community to get everything in place. And here's where the funsies could occur, right? Uh, I don't, again, this is policy and I punted on policy, but I would be a fan of strict policy uh, that your release doesn't go out unless you have certain criteria met. That means like all new features are documented. Uh, you know, all, all the other uh, accoutrements on user stories are in place. Uh, you have your test apparatus in place to test the features. And, and by forcing a hard audit, uh, that allows no new code to get in. So it incentivi incentivizes the, use, the developer base to actually make sure that they're doing the right things. I think right now we have a problem in the community of carrot versus stick, and we have no stick. We have no enforcement policy. Um, uh, but that's, again, I punt on that particular aspect of it, but that could be a potential policy at the end of the cycle when you go through what's called a stabilization or hardening phase. Um, it outlines here the idea of develop channels and stable channels, having them totally distinct and separate. Um, that's very common. You see that across a number of different distributions. Uh, you could think Fedora, RHEL, you could think whatever you wanted to, just having the two separate channels so it's, it's impossible for folks to get mixed up uh, from where they're pulling their sources from. <clears throat> it also allows folks to, uh, to do a little bit more mindful publications for features that are coming up because you have a long lead time of what will be in a series to know that these are all the feature enhancements that are coming up before you actually do a release. It also gives you a long lead time to do a bunch of notifications to the community to let them know that you are going to have this, uh, you're gonna go through a deprecation cycle for your old stable series releases. Uh, one of the things we spell out uh, at the end is that you only support two stable series and it's only regression fixes uh, and um, and CVEs, you you try not you never backport features. Uh, if the bug is not a regressive feature, you don't you don't fix the bug. You keep moving forwards in the develop series, as long as there's a reasonable working around. Now there might be some level of arbitration where you have to have criteria for evaluation, like if the bug is critical, if it affects so many users, you you need to have some way of backporting some fixes. But for the most part. You try to avoid backporting where possible. Um, yeah, so there's not a lot of extra information. I think most of the people who were here last time uh, listened to my shtick on this, but just there's a lot of more detail uh, put into here. Um, I guess I'll pause real quick to see if there's questions. I'm not sure if this falls under the uh, sort of the policy question, but what do you have um, a vision for what would happen to features who didn't meet whatever criteria or policy was specified? Like, would the release get delayed, or would they get kicked out somehow? Or they they get kicked out. 
Yeah. So like you have 12 months to plan a release and if you can't determine whether or not a feature is ready to go in that 12 month cycle, like they get kicked out. Um, and it's up to ARC and the rest of the people who are doing the release to determine the criteria for feature promotion, right? This gives a very long lead time for everything. So there should be no question of whether or not, um, I'm sure there will be questions, but I think the, the policy, if you create a set of policies that surround the model, uh, it, would, it would allow for folks to have like, these are the rules to the game. If you didn't read the rules and you're trying to play the game, then you know this is what happens, right? And you might miss a stable series and that's up to the person to, to, to pay the consequences for that. But the, the primary objective of this is to stabilize the distribution for the community. Yeah, I, the longer the time distance between stable series, the higher the uh, incentive is to try to get stuff into a given stable series, regardless of readiness. And so I appreciate the goal of this. I anticipate a lot of... Uh, I don't know if difficulty is the right word, but um, I, oh, just a, a uh, lot of, not gamesmanship, <laughs> but like trying to prove that things are meeting the requirements even when they might not actually be meeting them fully, just so they could make oh. the, the current release instead of waiting a year. Uh, you know, there, there's also this idea of that, like you could, you could have a set of criteria that are clear cut and make it very simple and then go through arbitration. So uh, like having a, a standard clearinghouse or a group of people like on SIGARCH that have to actually verify that this is worthy of backports. Um, but policy and process are gonna matter a lot to make this possible. Um, this is just a model, right? And, and there are so many different aspects to the policy enforcement and the processes around it that I couldn't possibly dictate all of them because each one is its own its own way of dealing with it, right? So like, how do you deal with backport features? What's the criteria that you want to enable? You oh could yeah, have I'm not even talking about backporting features. I'm just talking about yeah. like, Back does what makes it from the Devel channel to the stable channel? Um, and the, the incentives that this sets up. Uh, ideally, it whatever system we come up with aligns incentives so that um, when people do the right thing, it, uh, it works best and we want to avoid systems that motivate people to kind of fudge readiness, uh, to get something in on time. Yeah. Well, my, a part of the preconditions, which I need to blast out is that if you have V1 APIs, the idea of adding major features into Kubernetes should go down over time. Um, that's the whole purpose of having the CR date. CRD based extension mechanisms, as well as all the other accoutrements for extensions around Kubernetes, like the, decoupling the, a lot of those from the binary releases of the primary Kubernetes components. Exactly. Like I'm hoping that in the next two years time frame, like we, we just start to attenuate down and down to the point where like, it's just, it's a release and there's nothing really special about it other than there's a bunch of fixes. Mm -hmm. we're still in that weird state where like we haven't really defined the boundary lines of what's in is out very well. And we still have this weird crossover. And I think until the APIs have been promoted and until the boundary lines are a little more crisp, I, I think we'll, I don't think we can pull off this model to be honest. Yeah. Um, especially when we're talking about revving API dependencies of the actual components. So, I mean, we, we have a decent handle on the REST APIs and we have kind of roadmaps for most of those. Uh, there are a few stragglers. Um, the ones that are kind of on the back end, like the CRI type of things, as we talk about revving those, if the stable channel has lifetimes measured in years uh, and we have to have at least one 
release overlap where you support both the old and the new version, like when we bump from alpha to beta or beta to GA. Uh, we're talking about carrying APIs for order of years at this point um, before we can drop them, which uh, we might have to do anyway, but a lot of the documentation around like how, how long does it take to roll out a revision and how many things do you have to overlap support at the same time? Um, this this actually in terms of uh, months, but also in terms of releases. And so, this, the, yeah, the nice thing about having Devel series is it incentivizes people to actually set up Devel clusters to verify that what they're doing and the progression they're making to change or deprecate or move APIs or features is what people want, right? Hopefully, yeah, like yeah. making it more accessible to get feedback is great. Um, yeah. But we still have the kind of the absolute like someone who doesn't take the time to set up the develop clusters and only goes from stable to stable to stable. Uh, like we have to support n overlaps, at least two overlapping releases. Um, if the time frame is longer, it might, we might be able to drop the requirement to have three releases, but. Uh, yeah, I, in this, in this model, it says two, two stable series. Yeah. I, but I, I agree with that a lot of this doesn't make sense until the things that we're building on are at stable because trying to get from alpha to beta to stable when the cadence is years is kind of ridiculous. Yes, I agree. It, it wouldn't make any sense. Like a, a person who wanted to use a feature would not be able to. I, I think there's also, I think vendors, in their efforts to try and enable Kubernetes for other type of workload scenarios may have inadvertently caused some weird gravity problems with Kubernetes as well. Kubernetes would be much more ephemeral had we not sort of enabled some of the other user stories uh, inside of KK Core. And it might be beneficial for us to evaluate some of those features, namely the stuff that's been pushed into the kubelet uh and storage things to be extensive extension type mechanisms so that way you can opt into it but it sort of decouples the core it's just weird right we have we've made kubernetes stickier i've got a question about the the kind of origin background from where you're drawing this um You've mentioned the Condor project, I think, in the past, was it? Yeah. The, um, yeah. So th as a project, were they also the primary distributor of the project, or was there an ecosystem that involved other distributors? Yes, there's two parts. So like, uh, so Condor grabbed it originally from the kernel and then modified it like years and years and years ago. The Condor project is a 30-year-old grid project. And they, they grabbed it from the kernel and then they modified it. And uh, there's different layers of distribution channels that exist uh, to distribute it, uh, in part because it's installed inside large government facilities all over the world uh, in large science laboratories. So if you look at CERN or if you look at, uh, you know, any national DOE based lab, it basically condors the engine that's running across all their nuclear simulations. Um, and the, the upstream uh, had a distribution model of uh, this, this very analogous distribution model of a development stable series. Um, labs that wanted to use certain features to get ahead of the curve would always sort of have these separate pools. They would have their stable pool and they would have their develop pool. Uh, but they had much more uh, they had the ability to do federation and bleeding work over a lot easier. So you could federate from cluster A to cluster B. It was called flocking. So very easily, it was almost seamless. So you wouldn't have to care. Um, and you would be able to get signal out of your develop clusters super easily about what was working and what was not working. Uh, and that would, that provided a means by which to get early feedback. And we always gave those people like VIP status. Um, so those people would be able to uh, know when uh, they'd be able, we'd, we'd address their bugs as soon as they came in, et cetera. Um, 
Now with regards to distribution channels, the second layer was called OSG or Open Science Grid. We, we lovingly referred to it as Open Savants Grid. Uh, and the Open Science Grid basically was the, the wrapping of that plus a whole bunch of other grid-based tools and products that had Condor at its core, but there was all this extra tooling around how to federate across these different grid systems across the entire globe. Uh, so that way, like a, a job submitted from CERN could be federated out to tier one sites and then to tier two sites, and then they would go all the way down. So if you're if you're looking at particle physics collisions, you know, in some lab in Nebraska, even though it originally started in CERN. Um, so that that's like the layered distribution model and the, the use case behind it. The reason I ask is I feel like this model is probably more familiar at first glance to people who've seen sort of like the, the RHEL or the Ubuntu LTS or the SLES sorts of ways of doing things. And it almost then starts to, to make me want to ask like, why would the community embrace this versus just if it's a normal distributor model, letting the distributors do this? Uh, because a lot of people baseline not from distributors or they don't want to trust a distributor or they're accessing features that are only in the Devel series. Right? Um, so the nice thing about having the core have this model versus a distributor have this model is that it forces distributors to change and also allows them to, it has better support characteristics for them. <laughs> there, it actually helps them. Uh, because it makes their life a little bit easier for backporting features, or not backporting features, backporting bugs, uh, because then they can get it into their distribution channels easier. So it incentivizes distributors. Um, but th then it also like allows the community to have a, a baseline for, for people to adopt something that's stable and feel comfortable adopting it. Because I think one of the biggest problems with Kubernetes distributions is like, especially today is, uh, there hasn't been a lot of collapsing of the ecosystem yet. In fact, it's still growing. So like you get Kubernetes from everywhere, everything. I don't even know how many distributions there are. Last I looked, I think there are 80 with conformance, 80 ish. Yeah, that's kind of crazy if you think about it. But if you said KK was stable, easy to consume, uh, you could collapse a lot of that. So that, that way, like we get out of the distribution as a product business and get more into the, this is a core fundamental piece that everyone needs. Then you can layer on your other things on top of it, sure. And that, that could be an extra distribution. It's kind of, it gets back into the sort of like kernelish type of model where the Linux distribution is all the accoutrements and everything else around it that make it more fully featured, but that the core is pretty, uh, you have some expectations around what you're getting in a given time frame. I think the difference between this and the Linux model uh, and the reason why it worked better in grid systems is because government labs had these, you know, they had to be up all the time, running these things all the time. And you, you had certain outage, outage windows that you could plan. So swapping kernels, you know, making the kernel move to a single release model was actually not a bad idea. But for, for a government lab, they could only have this outage uh, time period to get an update in. And they had to be able to do it, you know, knowing that they had certain guarantees around a stable release. So it's easier to, for consumers to consume and, and feel some level of guarantees or quality of service. I wanna give anybody else a chance to ask any quick questions they have, but then we should time box and move on to Mikkel, I think. Uh, hi. So did we get the feedback from the survey that went out? Did we find some you know, clusters of people who want different sets of things? Not yet. Um, we are supposed to be getting the data tonight to start looking at. 
Yeah, uh, why I'm asking that is when we were trying to do this in OpenStack, we ended up finding like two distinct sets of users. Uh, one set wanted like, they wanted to pick a specific version of OpenStack and then they would wait to upgrade after two years or something. But then there was a, a whole another set of people from telecom who wanted like every three months on a clockwork. So uh, it was tr trying to fit a single model to both uh, was gonna be a problem. I expect something, uh, uh, more clusters here uh, of people coming from different backgrounds wanting different things here. Uh, We've definitely assumed that's going to be something in the data. It'll be interesting to see if that's a, right. affirmed or not. Right. That's that's why I'm asking because uh, we are talking about multi-year deprecation stuff, which is going to become a huge problem given the whole bunch of uh, uh, baggage that we are carrying right now, including uh, the cloud provider stuff. Yeah, that should be another uh, precondition. Yeah. Do you already have a list of preconditions there, Tim? Uh, no, I meant, to, I meant <laughs> to add it. So the uh, one was definitely the cloud provider. The other one was Jor what Jordan was trying to do, at, uh, which is uh, find a set of APIs that we need to promote before which we can start LTS, right? That was yeah, the other yeah. one. I mean, yeah. a lot of those preconditions boil down to do less so that there's less churn that like every three months someone is dying for some feature or enhancement. Like the more you do, the more surface area there is where people are going to like legitimately need lots of different enhancements and changes and features. If you do less and build more on top as extensions or add-ons, then a lot of the urgency hopefully goes away from this, you know, desperate need for a new thing in three months. Right. But Jordan, there is a balance here too, right? Uh, what seems to be happening is when we are pushing people out by saying do extension on top, then they don't want to come work on the core stuff. Um, you know, uh, that's the other thing that uh, we have seen uh, uh, definitely in OpenStack where uh, we told people to go away, do their own thing, and then they have less and less time to contribute to the comments, uh, so to say. Yeah, I, I think a question worth asking, uh, maybe more than the like the effort on contribution towards core is um, if these things are built on top today, even the things that are built on top kind of as add-ons add-ons are still bundled into a single release, you know, tar with manifests and things, uh, at least for some consumers. Um, and they're tested together. Like it's kind of this um, huge, uh, here's all the add-ons, here's the cluster setup scripts, here's the actual binaries themselves, and we test it together and then we release it together. And if one of those things requires an update for a bug or you know adds a new feature and wants to get that out, like it has to wait for the Kubernetes release train. Uh, and so if we're talking about lengthening, slowing down the Kubernetes release train because a lot of the function that people are using is in these add-ons or layers built on top, um, we would probably need to rethink how we distribute those add-ons and how those add-ons can release more rapidly to add features independent of a Kubernetes release train. Uh, yeah. That has definitely worked um, in OpenStack as well, where we said uh, the different projects can have different release cycles. They don't have to be tied into the uh, you know death march of a three-month release cycle. Uh, then people were actually doing better because what they were also doing was they were testing their components against multiple different versions sets of uh, other things. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's definitely helpful if we are able to decouple uh, releases of uh, the individual components. Uh, that's so, that's the ideal. We want to be careful we don't set up a, a dependency hell scenario where people are trying to they're using three different add-ons and finding a version of Kubernetes that works with all of them or where they work with each other is, is terrible. 
uh, getting getting APIs to stable and then supporting them for a long time is a good way to uh, to help that. So I want to time box and shift over to Mikkel at this point. Uh, before I do that, though, I do want to mention Lubomir has posted a link to a document similarly starting to outline a potential model or some thinking in this space as well. So give that a read. Um, Mikkel, yeah. I hand it over to you. Yes, so um, I don't know how to do this. I got a document with a bunch of questions that I mm -hmm. uh, answered here locally, and I can talk about that. Yeah, you're but our to ask you're, questions. It's also you're our first one. We've got a variety of folks who've expressed some interest in sharing how they operate, and we we kind of drafted up that document just to try to have a little bit of a level set yeah. across folks as they come. So tell us what you do. Tell us your yeah, story. So so a little bit about what Zalando is. We are in uh, Europe, the biggest fashion, online fashion um, retailer. So we basically, uh, you go online, you pick uh, some shoes or some uh, dress you like or whatever, and then you buy it and we ship it to you within a few days and you don't pay for the shipping and so on. Um, and we deal only with fashion, so we don't uh, do what Amazon does with, with all kinds of different things. And we sell mostly that, like we have all the, all the articles we buy in from um, the clothing providers or the producers, and then we, we sell that. Um, and for the technical side, we use, uh, we're trying to move everyone to Kubernetes, basically. We have 118 clusters right now that uh, our team is managing. We are a team of eight or nine people. Um, and the idea is that uh, we want to run like any kind of workload there. Uh, right now we have everything from like simple web applications for internal tooling or for external um, for, for our website and so on. And we have uh, a lot of like back uh, backend services, processing services and so on. Um, one of the recent things we did was move our search functionality, which is an elastic search cluster of roughly 200 nodes. Uh, to Kubernetes and it, we implemented an operator that can scale it up and down and so on. Um, and we also run a lot of Postgres clusters. Uh, so each team can basically deploy their own Postgres cluster. We have a Postgres operator also developed um, that, that manages this. I don't know how many Postgres clusters we have, but it's uh, a lot. Um, and uh, out of these 118 clusters, so roughly half of them are uh, production and the other half is uh, test clusters. And we try to like segregate the clusters into um, product or department or what you want to call it. Um, basically for the reason, one reason is compliance wise, we want to isolate who has access to what. We don't do like multi-tenancy within Kubernetes, we just isolate uh, to, to one cluster for a set of teams that work closely together on a product. Um, and we, we run in AWS, I did mention that, but we have basically one AWS account per cluster. Um, and then we use like AWS uh, permissions also to isolate who can access what. Um, and, and then we have one production and one test cluster for each of these products or departments. Um, and, and the test clusters, the users have full access to what kubectl can delete and create stuff but in production they have to go through a CICD pipeline to actually deploy something um, and yeah another reason for also limiting it is also to reduce the blast radio so if if something goes wrong in a cluster we don't take out the whole thing but we can manage it on like a limited set of services it still can be a lot, of course, if like the elastic search cluster go down, then yeah, then we lose our search functionality. Um, so yeah, but we cannot really <laughs> segregate that that more. Um, and we have yeah built a lot of tooling around to manage these many clusters. So we have, uh, for instance, there was a question about conformance testing. Basically, we whenever we do a change to our cluster configuration, we have like one source of truth configuration in a Git repository. And whenever we do a change, we run a conformance test from the Kubernetes uh, test suite and also have implemented some of our own end-to-end -end tests based on the end-to-end -end framework from Kubernetes. 
to, to test our ingress implementation and different aspects. And this we do on every PR that we make. So every change to our configuration is, is in trend tested, basically by spinning up a cluster and upgrading it from the previous configuration and then running the end-to-end test. So we are pretty confident that if this works, then, then uh, yeah, at least the cluster is conformant and has tested a bunch of, of the things. Um, and we also have like different channels for the clusters, we call them, where we basically have dev, some dev clusters, which is like a handful of clusters that are not so important and just test. And there we first roll changes out so we can uh, not only rely on end-to-end -end testing, but also rely on people running some stuff there and, and notifying us if they see problems or if we see our alerting go off or something. Um, and once we move from dev, then we move to, to alpha channel and to beta and all the way to stable. Um, and this kind of ensures us that we have some time uh, for, for teams to discover problems that we haven't discovered in our end-to-end -end testing. And we have like the, the test clusters are on the beta channel and the production clusters are on the, on the stable channel. So teams have some time in, in, in the test clusters before they get this, the update in, in production, um, which also allow them to update. I don't think we really have issues with like uh, migrating API versions or something like this. Usually it's possible within the same version of Kubernetes to have two versions running. So we often have enough time to, to let people just upgrade this or, or ask them to do it or enforce it somehow, but it's not really an issue for us. Um, and we try to keep up to date with Kubernetes. So in the beginning, we were faster. Uh, I think we started around 1.4 with the first cluster, and then we have upgraded them continuously and added more and more clusters. And now we are on, on 12.8. Um, and we are working on rolling out 113. So this is only in our dev channel right now. Um, and basically what, what keeps us not on, on 114 or something is just like the urgency is basically a trade-off between how many features are there and how many um, bugs are fixed that, that we need. And it, for 113 we haven't really like needed it. We just want to keep up so we don't lag behind when there's a 115 and then suddenly 112 is not supported anymore. Um, as I understand, it's like three versions behind, I think, that are supported. So this is like the main motivation, of course, if there are some features that we want. Um, I like what you talked about just before I got on about this splitting it up into multiple minor uh, components or add-ons or whatever because this is also how I think about it that Kubernetes for me is just the uh, masters and the kubelet and then everything around it is just things that we can put on top and it's much easier to update individual things from time to time than doing the whole uh, master and kubelet because for updating kubelet in our case means rolling the nodes and we have to move the workloads around. We have tooling for this, but it takes time and it takes time to roll back if we discover issues. So it's much easier to, to update all these smaller components that run in Kubernetes as daemon set or whatever. Um, yeah, what else did I want to say? Um, yeah, one thing that is also kind of holding us back on 113 is that we don't see any other cloud providers actually there. So we were rolling out 112 before GK, we realized when we were rolling it out and we discovered a, a, a major bug in, a, in our setup or in, with, with the way we ran the kubelet was basically a memory leak and, and, and this was a bit of a surprise to us and makes us a bit scared of going further because we fear that these versions are not really tested. So GK is right now on 112.7 and I think AWS EKS is probably also 112 or something, I haven't really checked. I don't know what Azure is on, but um, I think they are not further than that. And this indicates to us that these things are not really tested in the real real production. Um, so we are moving forward with 113 and we're not seeing any problems, but we are also a little bit hesitant to just move super quickly far, uh, forward. 
um, without having anyone else with like the, what we feel like is real production loads. Um, and yeah, so, so maybe related to this is like, what are the things that are, um, how do you confirm if a version is good was one question. Um, so basically we confirm it by the end-to-end -end test and by running it for some time in, in, in one of these channels to, to see if we discover problems. But, but often the hard things to spot are, are really when there's like there's a memory or something like push you. I think my internet dropped. Did you lose me? There was a hiccup, but you're back now. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so so uh, they're testing like performance of, of components where you have to run it for a longer time to see if there's a memory leak and so on. These are like the, the harder parts. I'm not now I'm just mentioning memory leak because this was the reason one. It's not like it happens every time, but uh, um, yeah, testing the, like the, if things work, uh, from the conformance test point of view is, is easy for us, but testing Yeah, more complicated and there. Um, what else did I um yeah we, we have so like, like our clusters also do like auto scaling. We we have we use the official auto scaler but with a bunch of patches to make it work better in AWS and like support spot instances, support different types of instances so we like our clusters is like you can deploy any few instances you can and, and they all look the same so there's no special cluster for this type of workload or it's just you can have different instance types um, and this is basically what the team wants we don't like help them so much they just request uh, a node pool of a certain instance type and then we provision that and they can deploy whatever um, yeah, I think this was my initial thing. So, uh, Mikael, how often do you upgrade a cluster as opposed to like burning it down and starting a fresh one? Uh, uh, we never burn a cluster down unless people don't need it anymore. Uh, we we always update. So the the oldest cluster we have is still the same one running, being upgraded to the 112.8 in this case. Um, so, so for example, when we switched over from HCD2 to HCD3, you wrote tools uh, to be able to do that? Yes. Okay. At that time, it was still early enough that we didn't have so much production load, so we were able to like just have a downtime, uh, but it was the same cluster. We didn't spin up a new one. We also run HCD outside of the master node, so we have like our own setup. We don't use Cube Atom or something like this. Uh, we developed this tooling before. It's basically just um, EC2 instances uh, with all the things installed, or we use CoreOS right now and just define all the things that we run um, as systemd units basically, and then we just uh, replace the instance uh, user data and replace the whole instance when we do an upgrade. So a rolling upgrade is what we're doing. Um, and HCD is outside of the master, so this is just this is controlled differently, separately. Right. We, since once since etcd three, we didn't really bother with etcd. It just works for us. Okay. Uh, how big is your largest cluster? Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention. So the average, just calculated on the average, is like fifteen nodes or so. Um, so not super big, but the biggest, like the the one with Elasticsearch, is two hundred and fifty or so. But it scales up and down. Um, is that average one five or five zero? Oh? One five. One five. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the the test clusters is pulling this average down. Um, there, there's usually not so much, and there's only one master and so on. Uh, so we have two masters in production, which obviously doesn't matter so much in terms of how big they are. But just for you to get an idea, um, the the normal production clusters, like the heavy used ones, are maybe between uh, twenty and forty nodes. I think. Um, and like when we start to scale beyond 200 nodes, then we start to uh, see problems in, in all kinds of uh, places because then our monitoring uh, 
start to to be problematic. The API servers need to be scaled up, of course. Uh, yeah, the number of daemon set pods that we are running is quite huge in that case, and yeah, so this is interesting challenges. That's also why I think having one big cluster in our case would like be un impossible. I think it's it's too much. Um, Right. Uh, so if, if I ask you what, uh, whatever we seem to be doing seems to be working for you at this moment, or at least you've gotten past the problem uh, phase where uh, you have developed enough tooling so things are easy for you. Uh, but what, what are the problems currently that you're facing that we could do better? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, you're right. We have really developed a lot of things and we are like, Quite satisfied with what we have, but um, but I th like I said, I think the pace is simply too fast for the minor releases to really keep up like reasonable. Um, like we have we have a team of of eight people to 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 manage this, and um, yeah, and 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 we we need to use it's not because it takes a lot of time to to test it. We have everything automated, but we, it takes time to like. Like a like a minor release rollout probably takes roughly a month just to because we want to be safe and we want to let people run the things in test before for for at least a week or something and sometimes longer. On terminology, can I just make sure we level yeah. set? When you say minor release, are you talking about a one dot x or a one dot x dot y? Yeah, one dot x, so like one eleven okay. to one twelve. Okay, That's what I mean. Yep, uh, and the, the patch releases the, are easy for us. Uh, okay. Yeah, it is like a major release. I will agree that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so I think that the, like the pace of that is is maybe maybe once every half year would be better than quarterly uh, in terms of just catching up. Um, and this is more like this feeling that you we don't want to get behind because we see it also like it's as a technical depth if we suddenly have to upgrade from several versions behind because there's some feature that we really want or something like this that is not backported. So therefore, we also aim from the very beginning to be able to update quickly. So we are not going to lag behind, but it's as, as we get bigger and bigger and have more users, we, we are getting slower, this we can feel. Not because our tooling is not there, but just because we have to be a little bit more careful. Um, and things like when we, when we move to 1.12, I think we wait until 12, dot five or something before all the bugs <laughs> that were introduced were fixed um and right it, it almost feels like once it hits one twelve five, then you call it stable <laughs> until yeah, then it's yeah. uh, a development release you know <laughs> yeah exactly and this and then then we rolled it out and then we had this memory memory leak in in kubelet um and then we yeah, rolled back again and and yeah, this was then fixed, but uh, these things was a little bit, we, we realized then, okay, GK doesn't even want 112 yet. Okay, maybe we're a bit too fast or, yeah. Would you say, Michael, that it's fair, that it's fair to say that uh, a lot of this has just been, you know, you've had, you've got burned by specific issues and now that sort of made you a bit more gun shy as you've, you know, as you've run this for longer, there's like, Oh, we had this issue or this upgrade and this issue or this upgrade and this issue or this upgrade. And so now we've got to sort of do some soaking to make sure that we don't have similar issues again. Is that, do you think that's the way you would say it? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I'm bringing this up like it's a big thing, but it, it's just the most reason that it's not like we have huge issues all the time. Um, but it is, it's more this fact that, um, why, why, why is no one else of the major uh, cloud providers on this version? Is, is this maybe an indication that this is not tested? This is what we worry about, I think. Um, do, you, do you have like a larger set of qualification procedures, some that might be a little more beneficial to the community, even if they're like workload enablement? Uh, so like if you had like example plugin style things that the community could use for verification uh, for like, different types of workload environments. It doesn't need to be in KK, like the, the Sunabwe extension mechanism is a way for people to validate their environments. Uh, do you have like a set of uh, extra tests or verification procedures that you create? Um, 
Yeah, so, so basically, like I said, we use the end-to-end -end test, uh, the conformance test of the part of the KK uh, repository. We basically pull this out into our own uh, Docker image and run this, and then we have ex extended this with some of our own tests, uh, which is like setting up an ingress and testing that our in ingress infrastructure works. So these are very like, uh, yeah, does, the, does this function work correctly kind of tests. Um, I don't know if this is what you mean, or you mean something different. Well, uh, it's it. You you answered it indirectly, uh, but yes, you have you have your own set of tests to do sort of your deployment verification. Yeah, so it, it also, does really uh, test that that all the things that we have running currently in the clusters would still work. It just tests that the cluster still works, all the things that we expect to work. So obviously we don't cover everything, but as much as possible. Um, and we also like enable stateful set tests there in, in Kubernetes, um, which tests like that you can attach a volume and so on. This is also very helpful for us uh, to, to see that everything still works and permission didn't get lost or whatever. Um, yeah, and this we have also, uh, this is public in our repository, so everyone can technically Get inspired by it, I would say, because you cannot just take it and run it. But uh, this is basically what we, what we do, and then we we rely on on users using the test clusters and and reporting if there is something that we didn't spot. As uh, as you run into scenarios that escaped, uh, I guess scale testing or like a particular characteristic of a workload, um, it would be be super helpful to in addition to reporting like whatever bug or you know we yeah. ran into this bug and this thing crashed or hit a memory leak or something uh, sharing details or if you have representative tests uh, so we could fold some of those back into our scale tests so that um, like the, the scale tests a lot of the scale tests we have are very narrow in the uh, types of workloads or the types of um, the, which dimensions they test. And so yeah. uh, we want to improve what we have so fewer things escape. Yeah, uh, I mean, we don't really have tests on, on, of that kind, like really testing performance. Um, I think this is mostly a trade-off of like how, because it, it's, it's like a more evolved test, it takes longer probably to run it. Um, and and then it's like a trade-off of between how, how long do we want to run tests between merging changes and so on. Um, and, and also like, yeah, it's, it's also more difficult to write, I think. Um, so we don't really have that. It's more like uh, right now what we have is just checking does, it, does this function work correctly? Uh, if I create an ingress, do I get the DNS name and everything in, in our setup? Um, or does PSP work as we expected as we also have tests for actually? Uh, which is now in Kubernetes, I think, which we, we started early with that. Um, but we don't really have like performance or tests that really like exercise it in that way. We have some with our, we have our auto scaling for HPA. We have a custom adapter. This one we test, but it's also not, it's based on the test in Kubernetes for stacks at uh, what's called stack driver. Um, but it's not so, Performance testing is more like correctness, I would say. But you, I mean, if we have, if we develop something like this, then we would be happy to to share. Yeah, I mean, someone someone accompanying a bug report with a test is like the holy grail. If you yeah. had that, we would love you forever. Uh, if you don't have that, even just a description of here's the shape of this cluster. You know, yeah. we had a lot of this type of object and we hit this problem um, yeah. would be helpful if it's something that we haven't been testing. We, we can yeah. go write our own tests, but, uh, but yeah, any information about kind of the shape of what you're yeah. running into um, would help us make sure that we have coverage in the right dimensions. Oh. Yeah. So just sir, for edification, I mean, that, that's the whole reason why we built Sonoboy was that we, we wanted all the data we could grab. So if you create it like a plugin for a verification, that gives that gives developers and administrators and operators enough information to know the shape and the knobs and the details of your cluster 
so we can actually reproduce it because the sheer number of knobs as a developer is fantastic. Oh, no. like the, the Kubla has 250 knobs last I checked. It was, I think it was 253. And not fantastic in like the good sense. <laughs> like, <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask if you could contrast the difference between a a minor feature upgrade, say one eleven to one twelve, and a security patch, uh, say the big API CVE that was released. How does yeah. that the process of rolling those changes out look the same or different in your setup? So I think that the only difference really is that we are more confident that less things are changed in the in the patch upgrade. So the upgrade the upgrade process is basically the same, but we maybe just do it faster. So we um, we just like make a change to our repository, run the intent test, merge it into the first channel, and then we maybe only went wait like one day or maybe even half a day if, if we see that nothing is really problematic with a patch release. Um, so it's just a matter of how fast we do it. Other than that, it's the same flow that we follow. <clears throat> and we also do like, we all, if there's no new features, we don't like uh, write uh, um, announcement emails to our users and so on. So, it's, so this just means that it's a little bit faster for us. Um, and we are, I think it's just a matter of being more confident that, okay, this change is very small or it fixes a specific problem we have. So let's just roll it out. Or if it's like a security incident, then yeah, it's clear that okay, we need to roll this out. Um, and we also try if it's a security incident and it's only affecting the masters, for instance, then we only change the masters and roll it out fast, and then the workers can follow afterwards. Um, well, I, I really appreciate you coming and sharing all of this with us, and I, I feel like you you represent well the mature type of user that we we hope to see. Yeah, we also like to think so. <laughs> Any other final questions? Or, um, actually, you know what? I want to leave these last two minutes to Nick just to, to mention one thing before we call the meeting. Thank you very much, Michael. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, um, yeah, my thing I needed to mention, uh, and it's only relevant, uh, for some small reasons uh, is that um, today's, today in Australia is my last day at last and I'll be moving to VMware. Um, I mention this only because uh, it, as one of the co-chairs, it means that VMware will now have three of the, of the co-chair slots. So we will need to talk about, uh, you know, what we do about that going forward at some stage in the future. Welcome to the team. <laughs> but yeah, Thanks, we, we should talk about this. I think it, it is important. When we, we brought in the set of initial leads, we were deliberately looking for a broad set of exposure and experience. And we don't want to have too much weight in one particular company or entity. And then also we want to span like the, the types of user scenarios, users versus vendors and all of that too. So it's something we should chat about more in the future as a working group. I don't think it's formally required for working groups where it has been for SIGs, but it's still a, it's a good practice. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to raise it here so that, you know, it could be on people's minds and we could, you know, talk more about it in the future things um, because it is time critical in that, you know, I'll be moving like now pretty much. All right, I'll put that on the agenda for further discussion in the next meeting. Thanks everyone for joining. I will upload the recording a bit later and thank you again to Mikkel. It, it's really great to get this level of detail from users. Oh, thank you for listening. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.